A word from Harry Emerson Fosdick's Living Under Tension. The worse the world is without, the deeper we all need to go within. The profound meanings of inward personal Christian experience become not less, but more important in a turbulent and dismaying era. What then are the essential elements in a vital religious life? Are they not a great need, a great salvation, a great gratitude, and a great compulsion? Indeed, it is a turbulent and dismaying era. And so we lean into the greats of need, salvation, gratitude, and compulsion. Grace and peace to you on this day. My name is Justin Linderes, and I serve as one of the co-pastors, along with Pastor Babette Chapman here at Augsburg University. On behalf of the whole campus ministry team, welcome to the fourth almost annual Harry Emerson Fosdick Lecture in Preaching. COVID-19 tripped us up a bit, but we are delighted to be back, both with some limited in-person gathering and for all those who are able to join on Zoom on this day. Our thanks to Janice Dames for handling all the technical side of things and making sure that this event, this lecture happens. Today, we welcome the Reverend Dr. David Loos as both our Fosdick lecturer and chapel preacher for the day. Dr. Loos is the senior pastor at Mount Olivet in Minneapolis, a familiar face, teacher, preacher here in the Twin Cities and indeed around the country. Uh, Dr. Loos has served as the president of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. He taught homiletics for many years at Luther Seminary and was the academic dean there. And he also pastored parishes in New Jersey. He has published several books, including the popular Book of Faith titles, Making Sense of Scripture, Making Sense of the Cross, Making Sense of the Christian Faith. David has taught many pastors and leaders in the church, including myself while I was at seminary. And I remember David always made space for students, for our questions, for our doubts, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And you, David, you brought that humble spirit with you. And it was a humble spirit that really, like, it's just a really unique hum humility that just courses with a passion for the gospel of Jesus. And your students, myself, always resonated with that and, and saw that as a model for us as we learned how to preach this good news. And so personally, I give thanks for that gift that continues to fuel my passion for preaching. And so uh, Dr. Lose's uh, lecture today is entitled, Does Preaching Matter More Than Ever? And so a quick word about our schedule following David's lecture, we will have some time for a few questions and Q&A. And for those on Zoom, you can, you, when that time comes, you can put those in the chat and we will moderate that. And that time, our time will conclude around 1125 as we have an extended prelude and then move into our chapel worship in which I mentioned David will be preaching. I'm also pleased to introduce the Reverend Greg Renstrom. Greg is a retired Methodist minister, former president of the Minnesota Council of Churches and a dear friend of Augsburg University. It was Greg who had this idea some six years ago that we should have a, a Fosdick lecture in preaching here on campus. And so we made it happen. We made it happen with Greg's generous support along the way. I'd be willing to bet that there is no bigger fan in the world of Harry Emerson Fosdick than Greg Renstrom. Although Greg did bring to my attention this recent collection I have over here, I'll hold it up in a second, of Fosdick sermons entitled Answers to Real Problems, Harry Emerson Speaks to Our Time by Mark, your UCC pastor in Verona, Wisconsin. And I see that the Reverend Dr. Yur is uh, is here uh, joining on Zoom, and I'm sure he is, uh, gives a, Greg a good running for a big fan of, of, of Fosdick. So welcome, Mark. And so I've asked Greg to say a few words uh, about this lecture and the importance of Fosdick for our day, and then following Greg's words, 
David will dive right into the lecture, Does Preaching Matter More Than Ever? Great. Thank you, Justin. As Justin indicated in just a few minutes, David Lose will be our fourth annual Fosdick lecturer. And he is selected as his topic, uh, a topic that is absolutely stunning. Does preaching matter, question mark, more than ever, exclamation point. And we who, uh, who are uh, fans, as, as uh, Justin indicated, of Harry Emerson Fosdick, need not look any further than the namesake of these sermons, of these lectures, for a person whose sermons mattered a great deal. His sermons meant much to literally millions and millions of people every week. Millions of people either listen to them at Riverside Church or listen to them on NBC Radio Vespers. Millions more read his collections of sermons that he published annually from about 1933 to 1946. And as I indicated a few years ago, millions of people even more were influenced not only by his preaching, but by a book review that he wrote in the late 1930s that put Alcoholics Anonymous on the map. His ministry was absolutely extraordinary. And of course, the question, when we think about his preaching, is why did his sermons matter? What were there about his sermons that, that made such an impression on people and made such a difference in people's lives? What, what, what can we learn? What lessons can we learn that might make our sermons better, stronger, finer, more meaningful, and matter more? Well, there are three things, it seems to me, that Fosdick's sermons uh, sort of uh, emphasized that made his sermons matter. First, his sermons were exceptionally personal, which means that they were relevant to people. He had this gift, this special gift, which he called clairvoyance, which was his ability to, to see and discern the needs of people and then respond to them accordingly. All you have to do is read the, the titles of the sermons he preached to see this, this personal emphasis and personal influence at work. For instance, living under tension, handling life's second bests, when life goes to pieces, facing life's central test, the conquest of fear, the con constructive use of fear, high uses of trouble, starting with trouble and ending with hope, and on and on and on. They all spoke to the personal needs of men and women of the times. Uh, people often assume that great sermons are crafted in pastor's studies, and they probably are to some degree. But for Dr. Fosdick, his great sermons were drafted and crafted in living rooms and dining rooms and hospital rooms and boardrooms, wherever people gathered where people met who he spoke to and met and counseled. His sermons were exceptionally personal. Also, second, his sermons were exceptionally practical. If they were relevant to people, they were also pertinent to people's basic everyday needs. Uh, sermons, I was taught at least, are supposed to be affirmations of faith. And his sermons were great affirmations. But Dr. Fosdick took that one step further and made sermons an application of faith. He gave good practical advice, though he never considered himself to be a psychologist or a therapist. In his sermons, he gave people helpful suggestions that enabled them to live. In a sense, he was following the lead that Jesus set. Jesus often gave advice, do this and you will live, do this and you will find eternal life, do this and you will have treasure in heaven. And one way or another, Dr. Fosdick was saying exactly the same thing. His, uh, his sermons drew on his personal experience and his sermons drew especially on the most painful, bitter experience of his whole life. But they all, uh, all, he drew upon all of that to give them a practical approach to preaching, personal and practical. And finally, most important, his sermons were exceptionally pastoral. I mean, everything was set in the context of his pastoral care and pastoral concern for people. If his sermons were relevant and, and, and uh, pertinent to people, 
his sermons were above all else transcendent. If you needed a, a biblical text for the whole of his preaching, it was probably that magnificent line from 2 Corinthians, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. And if his sermons uh, offer good advice, like every great pastor, they offered also good news. And he drew on the spiritual life to help people. And he drew on that horrific experience that he'd had as a young man. When he was a student at, United, at Union Seminary in the early uh, 20th century, he had a complete, total mental collapse. He became suicidally depressed and he didn't know what he could do about it. But he came to believe that prayer saved him. And so he took that potentially catastrophic uh, episode and made it into a curative experience and shared the good news of worship, scripture, service, justice, and above everything else, prayer and prayer and prayer. His sermons were deeply spiritual and exceptionally pastoral. Well, as I look at his sermons, personal, practical, pastoral, what lessons can we draw that might apply to our sermons? Well, I hear Dr. Fosdick saying something like this to us. Open your eyes to see the needs of other people. Open your minds to share the the good insights and suggestions that you have. And above all, open your spirits to give the good news to people. And your sermons will matter. And in his elegant phrase, you will be delivering the goods. And to continue this and to carry that, these themes further, it is an honor and privilege to introduce David Lowe's. David. Thank you, Greg, very much. Thank you, Justin. Janice, thank you for keeping things running. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I have uh, two connections to Harry Emerson Fosdick. Um, one is simply how much I value the seriousness with which, with, with which he took preaching. And he first authored a article on the problem with preaching that became uh, the bar to which every teacher and preacher uh, from then on would have to answer. What needs to be consistent, what needs to change. The second one is a little more personal though, and that is that the Mount Olivet Church where I happen to serve now, my uh, two senior pastor predecessors who served for 70 years uh, were both named Youngdahl. Reuben and his son, Paul. When Reuben came in uh, 1938, the congregation was 300 members. And by the time he left or died 30 years later, it was 10,000 members. And a lot of what he did there uh, was inspired by a visit uh, and conversation and studying the preaching and the ministry of Harry Emerson Fosdick. And so I feel uh, a debt of, of gratitude and responsibility to that tradition as well. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone who's tuning in to bear some indulgence because we have one uh, presentation, keynote presentation that Janice is running that you all are watching and she's going to screen share now. And one that will guide me so I won't run too, too long, although I will say when we get to about five minutes of, feel free to tell me. <laughs> um, and so I need to remember to push two buttons, one to guide me and one so you can follow where we're going. Uh, so the title we already mentioned is, Does Preaching Still Matter? Um, and I want to assure you that that is not simply a rhetorical question. And I probably should have just left the title as an open-ended question. Uh, I've already kind of tipped my hand <laughs> by saying more than ever, maybe more than ever. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that's ever a rhetorical question. Every time you approach the pulpit, I think you should be aware of uh, the number of people in your congregation who are absolutely mystified by what was just read from the lectern and are wondering what in the world those words written thousands of years ago have to do with their lives. But I would say that's even more true uh, today when you think about, and this, you know what, sorry, I'm just going to pause because I'm not sure this is, it is on. 
Is it just too far away? All right, I think, hmm? Yeah, that's, that's the fallback, <laughs> which means I will consistently say, next slide. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go one more, two more. <laughs> All right, uh, particularly this year, I think this question uh, is, we raise it with a different kind of urgency. Um, when you think about the year we've had between pandemic and the loss of livelihood and loss of lives, when you think about the just outrageous level of, uh, of racial injustice and inequity that we're experiencing to the point where we can't deny it, when you think about the level of political uh, divisiveness and really just, um, consistent target attacks on the structures of democracy and an entire rhetorical style that feeds off of division. Uh, and when you think about ongoing challenges like climate change, if you're not wondering when you come to church, if you're not wondering when you get in the pulpit, does anything I have to say matter? Then I don't think we're really paying attention to what's going on around us. Um, so the story that I wanna kind of root this in is the story of Jesus uh, on the way to uh, Damascus. And uh, preceding that is the resurrection story in Luke, which is a lot like the resurrection stories in the other gospels. And we won't, won't read through the whole thing, but I'd, uh, if we had a little more time, I think I'd focus on the disciples' dismissal of the resurrection story as an idle tale, but I'll save that for another presentation. Instead, what I wanna pay attention to is this last line. Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looked in. He saw the linen closed by themselves. He went home amazed at what happened. And then right after that, uh, comes, sorry, I'll stop pointing at the screen, <laughs> comes the introduction to the Emmaus story. Now on that same day, it was 13 and 14, and then you get to the end uh, when Jesus has been revealed and the breaking of the bread and the disciples then go back to Jerusalem to tell what they had. And then the very next line is a connector to the rest of Luke's resurrection story. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, what's fascinating to me about that uh, is that if you took out the whole, I think we're just a couple slides ahead. Uh, I, if you took out that whole story to Emmaus, the rest of that chapter would not only flow seamlessly, but it would look a whole lot more like the other four gospels, which tells us that this story that is peculiar to Luke was really important to Luke. And so he makes room, he pushes, he makes some elbow room and inserts this story in, which is I think for Luke a foundational story. Um, and when you read through the whole of the story, I'm always struck by the, by the first, uh, by the four words at the end. So you know it well enough, it's the evening of the resurrection, Peter has seen an empty tomb, no, uh, and two disciples are walking along and they are accompanied by a stranger. They don't recognize him, although we, the reader, know it's Jesus. He asks them what they're talking about and that leads them to share a summary of the events. Um, and then it's this last line, I think maybe the four saddest words in scripture. Um, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And when I think about that sense of brokenheartedness, the loss of hope, that for me captures what Emmaus is about and what so much of our lives is about and really what preaching is about, that the Emmaus story is a story about renewed hope. But we had hoped, and I think of this past year, how many people are saying that in so many different ways, but we had hoped for a greater level of equity, but we had hoped to be seen as whole persons, but we had hoped our kids would graduate, but we had hoped there'd be a job when they graduated but we would hope so many aspects of this last year has been a loss. It's been a year of broken dreams and disillusionment and a loss of hope, which for me makes the Emmaus story more important forever. That if preaching is gonna matter, what we need to recognize is that we have been suffering through an erosion of hope and hope is our call and task to preach. And I wanna distinguish very quickly that hope is different than optimism. And there I go to a passage which I think was the heart of one of the Fosdick sermons passed out a few years ago. 
when Paul writes, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've obtained this grace in which we stand, and we boast of our hope in the sharing of the glory of God. That justification, that the, the sense of acceptance and love of God creates hope. But then he goes on, and this is the line that Fosdick fo focuses on in one of his significant sermons. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting to tell you, Janice. <laughs> And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint because, and I think this is crucial, it's not about what we've done or who we are or looking ahead to the way things might get better. The ground for hope is because God has done something, poured God's love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. It reminds me of what's sometimes called the Stockdale Paradox. It's the words of Admiral James Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war during Vietnam for a number of years. And when he was being interviewed by Jim Collins, uh, they got into this topic of hope and how it differs from optimism. Uh, and he, Collins asked, who are the ones who struggled and didn't make it? And he said, oh, that's easy. That was the optimists. And Collins was really taken aback. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, the optimist, the one who said, we'll be freed at, after Christmas. And Christmas came and left, and they still were in prison. We'll be freed after Easter. We'll be freed next year. The ones who always saw something good or that things would take an upward turn just around the corner. And eventually that optimism was broken. And so what Stockdale said and said is the ones who survived were the ones who were hopeful. And then he defined this. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end which you can never afford to lose with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may, that may be. And I wanna just pause for a moment and, and ask you to think back one year ago and how different the last year would have been if we had had national leadership that was willing to confront the brutal facts of the reality in front of us, instead of denying it and dismissing it and offering false optimism almost every day. But if we had someone who had simply said, this is what's in front of us, we will prevail. Um, and so I wanna make that distinction really clearly that hope is rooted in uh, God's gift to us uh, and it is not, sorry, I'm, I'm, we're a couple of slides behind still, which is my fault entirely. Um, we'll get up to the mosaic picture, there we go. So I wanna focus on uh, four lines or four elements of the story to root us in four dimensions of preaching that can, I think, have the capacity still to create hope. The first is after Jesus comes alongside and they share their brokenheartedness, their loss of hope. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. The first thing I wanna offer is that our preaching to create hope needs to offer, open up, unfold, which is really the most literal translation of the verb we translate interpreted, to unfold the biblical story as a viable story with which to make sense of our lives. And there to kind of pause and recognize, I love this line by the poet Muriel Ruckheiser, the universe is made up of stories, not atoms. That stories become the con uh, common currency with which we make sense of and share our life, that it's very difficult to be in someone else's company for more than a few minutes and not begin to swap stories, whether they're about your kids or your profession or the news or what's going on. We're constantly telling stories. We're made up uh, by stories. We tend to think of ourselves often anthropologically as homo sapien or homo sapien sapien, the thinking being, but really far more, we are homo neurons. We are narrative beings who create the, the reality in which we live in and only through story. So I think part of the situation and challenge for us is that because we're narrative beings, our life makes sense in story, but our situation is that increasingly people don't know, we don't know our story very well. And if this was the situation in Emerson Fosdick, when you read his sermons, there's kind of a, 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 a confidence and a familiarity with the themes of scripture and the stories of scripture and the characters of scripture. So you can focus on one line or some whole sermons won't even mention scripture directly, but there's always a reference point that people know. And if that was Fosdick's situation, I think this is more ours, that biblical story has shrunk in our imagination. 
part of the challenge is that we, our people have tended to grow up thinking that scripture is a collection of information, whether it's historical or moral or, or doctrinal. We tend to think of scripture as a divine reference book. And our, I won't even say it, our challenge, our invitation, because it's a ton of fun when you start getting into it, is to think instead about the Bible as living word. This is a statue that's outside of a library in Nova Scotia, Canada. And what I love about it is that we've each had those experiences where we just found ourselves lost in a book or a play or a movie. Uh, and, a, and a book, the pages, the words just come off the page and surround us and they take us to a different place. And when we close the book or leave the theater or the curtains close, we're different because we've had another story added to our imagination that can shape the way we think about our lives in the world. And so what I wanna invite us to, invite our people to imagine is that scripture is not so much a collection of facts or information, but it's a collection of stories. And the one thing that holds all these stories across the several millennia in which scripture is written is that each and every author, and, and again, remember, it's, it's a more than a thousand years in different cultures and different languages and different assumptions about gender and sexuality and equality and all kinds of things that we wouldn't necessarily share. But what holds them all together is that each writer was gripped by an experience of the living God and had to speak had to talk about it, had to tell. And so each of those authors is making a confession. This is what it looks like when God gets involved in your life. And our, in this sense, scripture is this collection of past sightings of God, people who said, I saw God there and wanted to tell. And what it does is it doesn't, it doesn't give us a template to say, well, when God shows up, it will likely be in a burning bush or uh, it will be in the parting of water but it gives us clues, it gives us patterns to look out for. And our task is to read these stories of past sightings of God, to get a sense of the contours. What is it like when God gets involved in your life that help us then in turn see God today? That means it leads me to the second element of the story of Emmaus that I wanna highlight looking earlier on in the story and then at the end, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And then he interprets and opens up the scripture uh, and they gather together for a meal and in the breaking of the bread, then uh, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And Luke is repeating the same language that he's used earlier, describing the institution of the Lord's Supper. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And seeing plays this very fun, uh, important role in the story of Emmaus. The disciples can't see until the word is opened and they are gathered in fellowship and then they do see. And I think that names a second quality or task for us to help people sense and see God's presence in their lives. Again, I mentioned earlier, our situation is that we don't know our story very well anymore. Let's go one or two more. There we go. Um, and that is, presents some challenges. Walter Brueggemann uh, puts it this way. He says, for most of our people, God is no longer a primary actor in the story of their lives. What I like about that is it's not saying most of our people don't know scripture or most of our people aren't faithful. They're incredibly faithful, but that doesn't mean they understand what they confess. And it doesn't, under, doesn't mean they know the story well enough to have those patterns be a part of their lives so that they can see God as a character. They know God's an important character in the biblical story, and they know God really matters at church, but in their day-to-day -day lives at work or relationships, it's harder for them, for us, to name where God is active. Um, and so I think that close of the Emmaus story, then, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures up to us. That in our preaching, we're, we're, the task is to point to the biblical story and say, this is the way it looked like then. And then to be able to help people imagine this is what it might look like today. And it won't be the same. God won't necessarily show up to you in a burning bush and call you to some greater monumental task. And yet, if you were the staff or the supporters of one of our uh, Lutheran church camps in Colorado that a few years ago was caught in the wildfires that were raging uh, and you had to evacuate, and then you came back and saw the fires kind of scorching three quarters of the perimeter that left, but left the camp intact. That first story about God appearing in fire can help you claim the presence of God here, that God was here. Or when you think about the last time the Red River Valley flooded, 
and the devastation those floods caused and the way churches and people of goodwill come together, it's not the same as Moses leading the people through the Red Sea. But knowing that story allows you to have confidence that God will help you find a way through the waters today. We help people know these stories so that they can be in tune with the patterns of what it looks like for God to be active in the world and see God so their hearts will also burn. That brings me to the question of, uh, of meaning. One more slide, thank you. Luther's famous question, Vasistat, what does it mean? Um, and I wanna share a fear that I learned when I was taking my Bible classes in seminary. And that is that if I'm not very, very careful in my biblical interpretation of my Bible studies, let alone the Bible studies I'm not leading, they may get it wrong. They may misunderstand the scriptures or misapply them. Now, that's a significant, that's a real fear. I have seen bad interpretation and it is not pretty. <laughs> Truth be told, I've done bad interpretation. That's not very pretty <laughs> either. But it's a, it's a real concern. All of us know of historical examples from the 20th century up until now where incredible injustices were justified in the name of scripture through scriptural passages. So I wanna take seriously that concern for good and right and faithful interpretation. But I learned a new fear when I was in the parish and that has trumped it by far. The fear I learned in the congregation is that finally they won't care about this story. That we can get so cautious in our handling of scripture that it intimidates anyone else from reading with any level of enjoyment or confidence. James Smart years ago wrote a little book called The Strange Silence of the Bible in the Church. And he was convinced that as the education of clergy went up and up and up and the prevalence of historical and other critical methods of scripture became more and more adopted, which was only a good thing in Smart's eyes, it led to this commensurate gap between where the clergy person was citing sources and commentators and explaining the Greek and the average reader thinking, I could never do that. And so I think our invitation is to think about meaning a little differently. And one of the maybe ways to do that is to help ourselves imagine that the primary goal of biblical study and preaching isn't to find necessarily the original meaning in the passage, but instead to find yourself in the passage. Are these characters you can relate to? Is this a story that has resonance with the stories of your life? Can you imagine going through experiences that are similar to those in the biblical passage. And one helpful way to do that is to shift from our kind of obsession with meaning to meaningful. And that invites us to bridge the gap between pulpit and pew. Um, Mark uh, Allen Powell, who's a New Testament professor at Trinity Seminary for a number of years, wrote a book by this very title. And in it, he does this little uh, study or he conducted this kind of informal study where he would invite first uh, pastors and then everyday Christians, what we sometimes call lay people, to talk about the Bible. Uh, to, he gave them each a passage and said, just write a couple sentences about what this means. And then he took those and shuffled them all up on, on note cards and then would read them. And he did it at the presentation I was at. And he would say, I'm gonna read the first six words. You tell me if it was a clergy or a lay person. Uh, and, and so the cards would be something along the lines of, uh, St. Luke is interpreting this story, clergy. Jesus wants me to lay. I think the point of this passage, clergy, <laughs> God is speaking to me, lay. And what he wanted to point out is that word meaning can have two meanings, that sense of the intent of the author, uh, the rhetorical force, but it can also mean its effect on me. What happened when I heard something? What does it mean to me, and then he kind of encouraged the clergy in the audience by saying, so I did a second round and I asked clergy not what does it mean, but what does it mean to you? And the good news is you're entirely capable of answering that question still, it hasn't been educated out of you. And so I think for me, that's been a really powerful tool is to think about the importance of the meaningfulness of the passage. In a lot of ways, most of our exegetical skills that we've been developed are help us understand what the text meant and ideally then we sort of raise the question, what might it still mean? But I think the future tense of that, what will it mean? What could it mean? What could it do is equally important. So to begin asking these kinds of questions in our biblical study, what impact does it have? What claim is it making? Where do I see God active? How does it help me see God in my life? Become fundamental and important questions. Third thing I wanna raise from the Emmaus story. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. 
And then a little further uh, in the story, uh, Jesus comes alongside and he said, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him. Now, I tend to think that of all four evangelists, uh, Luke is the most skilled as a storyteller. Um, I mean, I don't, uh, if you disagree, I'm happy to talk with you, but you're wrong. <laughs> Just think of some of the distinct parables in Luke, the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son, uh, that Luke is, has a very keen self-awareness as an author, as a historian, as a storyteller. And so the details that he sprinkles around his stories are never shorthanded, especially when it's an extra story like Emmaus. And I'm struck that most of the story begins with two nameless disciples walking to Emmaus. And then in the course of the action, he reveals the name of one, Cleopas, but not the other. And I think that's Luke's invitation to imagine that you and I are that other disciple, that the invitation to enter into the story. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, and the other, you and I, are there listening, which invites me to come to the third point I want to share then, that part of our task of preaching today is to share an identity as a beloved child of God, a disciple, one called to follow Jesus by loving others. Stories, uh, perhaps more than anything else, convey identity. In fact, there's a whole and emerging field in psychological counseling, which is narrative counseling. How do you un, un, uh, first detect and unearth and bring to the surface to examine the stories that we tell about ourselves, that we tell over and over and over, but I'm really good in these circumstances, or I'm not going through that again, or I tend to freeze here, or and this whole strand of, of psychology is to invite you to, to examine that story and ask you whether or not it's still true, maybe whether it was ever true, and invite you to entertain the possibility of another story. Back to Ruckheiser, the universe is made up of stories, not atoms. And I want to just touch briefly on, I think, what are four of the dominant cultural stories that we hear over and over again. One is the story of consumerism, you are what you own. Another is the story of the media, which is image is everything. Another story is the story that there is not enough. And the last story, you should be afraid. And I was struck when I came across this quote not long ago because it was uttered 60, 80 now years ago, and yet it rung as true as ever today. The people can always be brought to do the bidding of leaders. That's easy. All you need to do is tell them they're being attacked. It works the same in any country. This was the philosophy of Nazi Germany. It has infected the soul of this country, too, and the politics of fear. Now, what's striking about all these stories is that they're all stories rooted in scarcity. They're all stories devoid of hope. And out of that sense of scarcity and lacking hope, we are invited always to see those around us in oppositional, competitive terms every single day. Whereas the biblical story is one rooted in abundance. One more. <laughs> and then one more and work together. <laughs> Thank you, Janice, for your patience with me. I've often told students that uh, to value and treasure the distinctiveness of each of the four Gospels. They tell much the same story in different and distinct ways, and also to point us for a clue to the distinctive take of that Gospel to the first public thing that Jesus does in each one of them. And even though they're telling more or less the same story, they're really interestingly different. Uh, so after Jesus is baptized, after he calls his disciples, which is kind of universal, then comes the first public action of Jesus in each of the Gospels. In Matthew, uh, he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, which begins with the Beatitudes, this conveying of blessing on people that the culturally generally doesn't view as blessed. Those who grieve or mourn or are being persecuted or hunger for righteousness. These are people who the culture would never say are blessed, and yet Jesus pours on them, names them as blessed of God. St. Mark begins with Jesus facing down the demonic powers of the day with an exorcism. The first thing that happens is Jesus goes to a synagogue and sees someone caught up, trapped 
unable to enjoy the abundance of life and cast the demon out. In St. Luke, it's Luke's uh, Jesus' sermon in Nazareth, the proclamation that he has come to bring good news to the poor, the release to the captives, ability to the lame, sight to the blind. And in St. John, it's abundance. The first public thing Jesus does is at the wedding of Cana, where there is a drought, not just of wine, but a blessing. And he creates the sense of overflowing more wine than they possibly could drink because there was more blessing than they could possibly ever consume. And all of that together creates this gospel story of abundance, which runs so incredibly contrary to the red thread that goes through all the stories, so many of the stories of our culture, which is of scarcity. And it brings us kind of almost immediately to John, the, the Good Shepherd passage And John. I have, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it in abundance. Our call is to offer our people an identity rooted in the promise of God, that there is enough, that they are enough, symbolized nowhere better than bringing a helpless infant and washing that boy or girl in the waters of grace who has done nothing, can do nothing, doesn't even understand it, won't understand it for years and years. And yet there is God saying, you are mine, beloved, always. So think back to some of the taglines of the dominant stories of our culture right now. You are what you own. Image is everything. There is not enough. You should be afraid. And then translate that or offer an outer antidote or a counter story from scripture. And what you end up with is you are worthy. This is the message of baptism. Before you can do anything, you are counted as one with Christ. You are so totally enough. You have more than enough to enjoy and to share and be not afraid. The verse quoted, the, the command offered more than anything else across the pages of scripture, not actually 365 times, which I always see once for each day, which would be really, really cool. But one day I did finally count them all up and it's about 120, <laughs> which is still a heck of a lot. Our call in preaching is to share an identity, reminding people that they are a beloved child of God called to follow Jesus by loving others. We discover who we are only when we discover whose we are, a treasured possession of the Lord God Almighty. Identity, and this is, I think, something that's easy to forget, identity is always a gift. It is the one thing you, positive or negative, identity is always something given to you. It is not something you can achieve on your own. It is always a part of something that emerges in and through our life in community. Um, and once we are given the gift of a healthy, beloved identity as a disciple of Jesus, it invites us to discover who we are in relation to who we are with. Brings me to the fourth and final element of the Emmaus story that I want to delve into. That same hour after uh, the revelation of Jesus and the breaking of the bread, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Now, an earlier detail in the story is that they're traveling and Jesus makes as if he's going to travel on further and they urge him to come inside with them. Why? Because the roads are dangerous at night. And so they're offering the stranger who's opened up the scripture shelter for the evening. But once they are in the presence of the Lord, once they have seen who it is who has been with them, then, and this is the startling part of this passage, they, that same hour they got up and they go back. The seven miles to Jerusalem, they're unafraid. And they can't help it. They have good news to share, something to tell. And so they told, when they gathered their companions, uh, told them about the meeting on the road had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The last element I want to talk about from the Emmaus story is that we're offered, we're invited to offer a sense of purpose that is rooted in the need of others. I want to just go back for a minute or two uh, to uh, Martin Luther briefly. And I want to do one of my favorite things, which is to try to do an exercise in translation. Just remind you a couple more till we get to the picture. Of, there we go. Of two elements of Luther's thought. Uh, one is that we're justified by grace. You know much of the story. Luther's problem is that he believed that God is holy and demands righteous, but he is not righteous. And so, as he will say at several points in his writing, reading the scriptures, the story of the gospel, uh, absolutely the presence of God terrified him. And it wasn't until he discovers uh, scriptures uh, and reading as the story of God's righteousness given to him, which is where we get justified by grace, that it ends up being something that's uh, inviting to him or important to him or life-changing. 
I think it's really important to say, do we struggle with Luther's problem? And too many sermons, particularly in Lutheran context, assume that we do, that we live our lives bent over with the fear that God is judging us. I do know a couple of people like that. <laughs> Honestly, not that many. Um, and if we preach the, the message of the gospel in those 16th century terms, I think we shouldn't be surprised that people don't always relate. Uh, so not if we define it as worry about um, whether there's an angry God, uh, but I would argue that we've never been under more pressure to prove our worth. That we've never ever been under more pressure to prove our worth. Um, and so I wanna think about three factors together that come uh, along these lines. One is now it's been 60 years since the advent of inad inadequacy marketing. And that's simply that when you watch uh, the television commercials, the dominant message is that you are not enough or have enough, that you are not acceptable as you are. But the good news is if you buy this product, you'll be a little bit closer to being more acceptable. And that's been uh, the dominant thrust of advertising for three quarters of a century and it has made an impact. The second one I alluded to just earlier before, and that is the politics of division. That there is a, an incredibly toxic force at work, and it's not new, it's not just four years old, but it has come up in a new way that seeks to pit us against anyone who looks different, believes different, thinks differently, and certainly votes differently. Even when you see it tearing apart a single political party, that's not enough, even that identity can't hold under the threat of division. And finally, um, just the, the reality, the omnipresence of social media. Uh, and, uh, you know, we could do lecture after lecture after lecture on the rise and the spikes of anxiety among our youth directly correlated the amount of time they spend on social media. To break that down a little bit, inadequacy marketing drives us to meet our needs to justify ourselves through consumption and is absolutely unsustainable for ourselves and for our planet. The politics of division invite us to craft an identity that is not healthful, but is always in opposition. It's more important to know who you're not and who you're against than who you are or who you are for. And social media, when you think about it, relies or raises up kind of relentlessly, sorry, three more clicks. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, that your self-worth comes only and entirely through affirmation, hopefully adulation. It is likes, follows, clicks, views that you're constantly tracking that and the pressure to create an acceptable self and put it out in public to garner that level of affirmation, which is why it has driven such incredible levels of, of depression and anxiety in our youth. I've oriented those around an upside down triangle because it can't help but remind me of what I always think of as the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I because of the incessant drives of these, that we are living now at a time where we are in the culture of the outrageous, that if views are everything, then the only way to get a view when there's so many competing channels is to be more and more and more outrageous. And if that doesn't help understand the last four years, then I'm not sure what will. But also the, the other side of that is it's created an, an age of unrelenting narcissism, where we don't even think twice about someone making ridiculous claims, I am the best at, better than, no one has come before, because we've just part and parcel of this incessant focus on ourself, can't help to yield narcissism, or to lead back to the, to the reformers, the Latin phrase that they use to define sin, incurvate se, to be curved in on oneself. And that pressure to justify ourselves, whether by possessions or beauty or wealth or power has never been greater, to our detriment, but also to the detriment of all of those around us. I found this uh, quotation kind of really interesting. Self-judging, self-justification and judging always go together. How else do you know how you're doing if you can't compare yourself to the slobs around you? And so the need to self-justify leads us to judge others. And then the flip of that, just as justification by grace and serving others go together. And that's Bonhoeffer. What all of this does is invite us um, to reclaim an understanding of the gospel uh, that frees us, just a couple more, uh, that frees us to serve others. Justification, God's declaration that we're loved and accepted, declared worthy and holy, it's a better story than the one we're offered. And it invites us to the second part, the flip side of Luther's theology, which is that of vocation. I think we're just a couple more. There we go.
Um, God's acceptance frees us to love and serve our neighbor. It points us to the possibility for discovering meaning and purpose all around us. And this is what's, I think, really interesting to me, that when you think about the pressure right now, we are, I'm sure, at, at Augsburg, as we were at Luther, as my congregation, some of the watchwords of the day are innovation and entrepreneurship. And what we look for in leaders increasingly is creativity. And I'm all for all of those. But there's a way in which we can imagine those dislocated from a sense of the need of the neighbor in a way in which we can put additional pressure on ourselves. Am I creative enough? Am I innovative enough to be worthy? And the challenge is that those things are always and only validated by someone outside of you. That how do I know if I'm creative if I don't have people saying, wow, he's creative. How do I know if I have a good idea if I don't have a certain number of likes to the post that I make or the tweet that I put there? Whereas the, the phenomenal thing about the sense of purpose and meaning of vocation, of service to neighbors, is that it's always right around the corner. It doesn't demand any external validation because guess what? There is need everywhere and your neighbors are everywhere you turn. So we have this invitation to discover meaning and purpose in the needs of our neighbor right where we find ourselves. And I love this quotation from Luther. Um, and I think it's striking that it's a father, uh, not a daughter. When a father goes and, and uh, oh, you, that was the reveal. Go back, go back. <laughs> um, when a father goes ahead and washes diapers or performs some other common task, and it's easy to miss the scandal of what Luther's saying because in the 16th century, no father changed diapers. And in another passage, says, and others around him call him an effeminate fool. Yet God and all God's angels are smiling. That when you get your hands involved in the needs of others, those near you and around you, no matter how messy or how meaningful, you are, yet this is pleasing to God and a steady source of affirmation and purpose. And I think you know something about this. <laughs> I don't know who is responsible for the tagline, motto, summary of mission, but I just think it's brilliant. I mean, we are called, period. Augies. I think what's amazing about it is it lifts up a core part of your identity as Augies, and the period distinguishes it as something you have received from God. There's one statement there and two statements, and both are important. And it's a gift that I've seen this school exercise in service to the community and world over and over and over again, and that's our call in preaching to orient our people that the real meaning, the real value, the real where they discover worth is in service to others. So just to back up a little bit from Imaeus, our call, our invitation through this story and all the reading and preaching of teaching of scripture we do is to offer uh, a viable story that help people sense God's presence to give them an identity uh, rooted in acceptance that helps them discover meaning in service to others. Just a couple more, sorry. <laughs> there we go. And I think when we work at that, and at the end of the day, it's as much God as us, but it is us and it is God and both those things are worth holding together. When we labor to do that, then what we hope to create, what we hope to give our people is hope. The hope that burns in their hearts, which is why preaching still matters. Amen. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone watching for your absolute patience uh, as, uh, as we work within the constraints of where we are and give thanks for the technology that allows us to connect with so many people in so many ways. So Janice, again, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we, we have maybe a time for one question. Is that all right? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, saw, I saw one in the chat. Here, is, are you able to cue that up or should I come on over? I saw one in the chat. Um, oh, that's a long one. That's from uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark Hansen. Is there a risk in people of privilege and means talking so confidently about abundance and despairingly about scarcity that we dismiss those for whom the scarcity of justice, food, clean air, meaning is a live reality and narrative. Might reconciliation alienation be a more effective framing narrative 
than abundance scarcity. Uh, I'll just end it there. He, he puts a, a Lish quote in there. Can you uh, say, Mark, I love that you're here and that's a fantastic question. Can you do the last sentence again? I was really struck by that. Yeah, might reconciliation, alienation be a more effective framing narrative than abundance scarcity? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And I think the question of, particularly of, is there a risk of privilege and then fill in the blank, is one that anyone that has the level of privilege that I do or most of us gathered uh, around this lecture do. It's a vital, vital question. I would say absolutely there is. Second thing I would say is I'm for as many sets of terms uh, as we can come up with because they will work and translate in different situations and alienation and reconciliation are two powerful ones. At the same time, um, I think there is a earthiness about scarcity when you name it concretely, the scarcity of others uh, and are willing to be honest about that and, and recognize the level of privilege it takes to be, even be able to talk about that with confidence when I'm not experiencing it, that's very different. So I'm all for finding other terms that substitute, but I'm not sure I'm ready yet to give up a pair because of risk. I think any of those terms, alienation reconciliation, I think there's a risk of an intellectualism that is another kind of privilege that would be very difficult for most people to hear, understand or relate to, but certainly in our internal discourse I think the other question I would ask along the same lines, and I thought when I heard the beginning of the question is maybe where you were gonna end up, is the other issue of privilege is that we do not turn uh, vocation into a privilege or that we don't allow our, the level of privilege we enjoy to make vocation kind of a bourgeois reality, where it's very easy for me to talk about the satisfaction I get from my work uh, with the level of compensation I have and the people I get to work with and the relative comfort and the connection between what I do and a sense of meaning and purpose. That is so, so much harder, which is I think where we need to pull vocation out of simply occupation and imagine it again as a calling wherever you may be to meet the need of the neighbor immediately around you. Um, I think the piece that's missing from or, or where, where I would want to move next in thinking about that is what happens when you think about justification and vocation under the lens of a theology of the cross? And in what ways are we in the act of serving neighbor crucified to the privilege and the levels of stability and identity rooted in ethnicity or gender or power what does it mean to have an ongoing crucifixion of that in our service? And is, this, is the call to serve those around us, is that a constant opportunity to be emptied and to be filled again uh, by life? I think of Bonhoeffer, one of the times he says, grace is costly because it costs you to die. Uh, costly grace is costly because it calls you to die. And it is grace because it gives you the true life. Um, and I don't think that's a once and done. And so again, all for thinking through different sets of terms. And really, I think the thing that I would find most helpful is when we're in particular contexts and particularly with our neighbor and the neighbor that is not necessarily like us or our usual neighbors, that is not the person next door, but the person in need to ask and to talk and to listen and to hear what connects and makes sense. Thank you, David. We're gonna let David catch his breath for like a minute before we move into worship but thank you again for for this time my pleasure thanks again for your patience <laughs>
Jesus says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Welcome, welcome to those in person and on Zoom to our chapel worship at Augsburg. May the word of God sustain and nourish us in this time. For the past hour, we've heard from the Reverend Dr. David Loos as our Fosdick lecturer in preaching. And now in our worship, we hear a, a proclamation of God's word and realize anew how it is that preaching indeed matters today. Thank you, David, for spending the morning with us here at Augsburg for reminding us of our call, a vocational call that we are indeed called Augies and for preaching in our worship. And our thanks to our chapel musician, Tom Witt, for leading our congregational song. And so at this point, I invite you into a call to worship. And there might be some bolded parts for this, but uh, whether you, you respond spoken aloud or in your heart, know that this is the call of the assembly. We come to this time of worship honest with ourselves and each other that all is not right within us, within our institutions and communities, within our city, our country, and the world. God of grace, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. We come trusting in Christ's promise of freedom and a palpable sense of the presence of God for all of us who live under oppression and for recovery for all of us who falsely cling to systems of privilege and power for our salvation. God of glory, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. We come empowered by the Holy Spirit's anointing to live into the counter narrative of unconditional love and redeeming grace fulfilled in the embodiment of God in Christ Jesus. God of love, Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving you whom we adore. We come with purpose and calling, unbound and free, to worship our glorious God. and God of glory on your people for your call on your ancient church's story bring it but to glorious flaw grant us wisdom grant us courage for the facing of this hour for the facing of this Lo, the hosts of evil round us scorn the Christ, assail his ways. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage of these days, for the living of these days. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving you whom we adore, serving you whom we adore. Let us pray. God of hope unbounded, in Christ, you entered into the wild wilderness of this world's turmoil with the very presence of your divine love. Strengthen our faith in this Lenten journey that we, we may catch a glimpse 
your alternate reality rooted in resistance to evil and transformed by trust in the fulfillment of your word through Jesus Christ, our sojourner and our story. Amen. The scripture passage chosen from this day comes from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, most of us are reasonably familiar with the story of Jesus' temptation. One version of it or another is read, after all, each year on the first Sunday in Lent just a couple of weeks ago. So we are familiar, so familiar with it, in fact, that it's easy to forget that by all accounts, the four evangelists themselves were not totally sure what to do with this peculiar little story. Mark, the first of the four gospels to be written in the primary gospel of this year's lectionary, only gives the full scene we just heard, a single verse and sentence. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Yeah, that is it. Almost as if Mark knows that he can't get away with that, including this little story, but really, really does not want to dwell on it. And John, the last of the four Gospels, doesn't mention it at all. John simply cannot imagine or conceive that Jesus, the eternal word and son of God, could possibly be susceptible to temptation, and so it has no place in the story he tells. I think the temptation story is uncomfortable because well, while we confess the Nicene Creed that Jesus is both fully God and fully human, truth be told, we're a little more comfortable with the fully God part. And so the idea of Jesus being tempted, like really struggling to keep the faith, is a little hard to hear. And so Mark makes just a passing reference to it, and John omits it altogether. One of my colleagues at Mount Olivet just preached a sermon on Sunday stressing the absolute humanity of Jesus, even suggesting that Jesus might have learned something through one of his encounters. And I heard it and loved it and knew there'd be follow-up emails <laughs> because it is very, very hard for us to take it seriously that Jesus is human. And the church has wrestled that for hundreds, thousands of years. Matthew and Mark, however, in contrast, Matthew and Luke, however, in contrast and writing between Mark and John, in this sense, the well-adjusted middle children of the Gospels, and you can believe I say that as a middle child myself, Matthew and Luke portray Jesus' temptation in some detail. Why? Because they believe that in the story of Jesus' temptation, we see the history of Israel and indeed the whole world encapsulated in his experiences. And so they also hear and want to share in the account of his refusal to give in to temptation Nothing less than the good news that in God's only Son, there is hope for all humanity and all history. 
in particular, as Luke and Matthew write, and today we're focusing on Matthew's account, they see two episodes of Israel's history and human history being repeated here and now in the life of Jesus. The first is the story of the temptation of Adam and Eve. You know the story well. Adam and Eve are created to be equal partners, intending the world, God's garden. They're given tremendous blessing and liberty, but also have limits set for them. In particular, they may eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except the one that gives them perfect and complete knowledge. And that's when the tempter enters the story, questioning God's command and inviting them to question their relationship with God. And Adam and Eve falter and then fail, mistrusting God's promises, taking matters into their own hands. And so when the people for whom St. Matthew originally wrote hear the story of Jesus' encounter with the tempter, they immediately think of Adam and Eve and the story of their fall. The second story is highlighted in the detail that Jesus isn't just tempted, but he is tempted in the wilderness. And that word, wilderness, always symbolizes a place of tempting and trial and testing and challenge and repentance. It's in the wilderness, after all, that Israel wandered for 40 years as Jesus is now tempted for 40 days. You likely know how this story goes as well. God rescued Israel from the Egyptians, leading them across the Red Sea toward the promised land. God had given them Ten Commandments and all the provisions they need. And when they're on the brink of entering into that promised land, the Israelites falter, doubting God's promises and saying that when push comes to shove, they'd rather not take on the challenge of settling this new land, especially when there are already people living there, but would rather take their chances on their own. And so God grants their prayer, saying that rather than enter the promised land, they will wander in the wilderness for 40 years until every member of that stubborn and faithless generation dies. God will take the children and grandchildren into the land of promise, but not those who refuse to trust in God. And so when Matthew's original audience hears him tell a story about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, they immediately go back to that story of failure and wandering. History is repeating itself. Now, as distinct as these two stories are, they have one profound thing in common. Whether it's Adam and Eve or the Hebrews rescued from Egypt, the pivot point and tragedy of the stories is that these characters lose their confidence. They lose their trust in the relationship they have with God. Likewise, trust is the dominant theme of Jesus' temptation. Notice that the tempter begins those first two temptations with the same words. If you are the son of God, command these stones to be bred. Throw yourself off the temple. The third temptation is like it, inviting Jesus to abandon his claim as son of God and worship the devil instead in exchange for power. Three times the tempter attempts to sow doubt about whether Jesus really is God's son, about whether God really is trustworthy. And to each of these temptations, Jesus responds, not simply by quoting scripture. I always find it instructive that the devil quotes scripture pretty well too but rather by reaffirming his trust in God. Jesus, St. Matthew wants us to hear, us to hear is different from those who came before. Jesus not only refuses temptation, but also not only here, but also again at the end of the story, when he is betrayed, denied, tried, crucified unjustly. He doesn't come down from the cross, even though people there tempt him to, beg him to. He does not resort to violence, even though his own disciples urge him to. He will not take matters into his own hand. Throughout the story, Matthew tells Jesus keeps faith, trusts God with the future, and so doesn't feel the need to take matters into his own hands. How? Well, the easy answer would be, well, good Lord, he's God's son. <laughs> and I imagine there is something to that but I think Matthew would offer a slightly different answer. Most of you have probably heard that the three most important words in the world of real estate are location, location, location. And I'd say the same is true of reading scripture. So to hear St. Matthew's answer about how Jesus is able to keep faith, it's vital to note that Matthew locates this story of his temptation immediately after the story of his baptism. So here the beginning of today's story about temptation in the wilderness prefaced by the preceding verses 
about Jesus' baptism. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You see what I mean? We hear these stories in isolation and tend to separate them in our imagination, but they are one story. It is one narrative sweep. Immediately after Jesus is baptized and hears the voice of heaven, name him God's own beloved son. And only then is he prepared to endure wilderness and temptation. So I think Matthew is telling us that because Jesus received in baptism his blessing and his identity, he can now endure and withstand the temptations hurled at him because he knows he is God's beloved child. And the same is true with us. There is so much going on in our world and our lives right now that grieves and exhausts us and it grieves and exhausts the heart of God. A pandemic that's been raging for more than a year, causing losses of all kinds and taking the lives and livelihoods of so many. Devastating wildfires across the Western states that are now experiencing severe drought, which will make that cycle of fires only worse again this coming summer. Dramatic and dangerous political polarization that's undermined the confidence in some of our most basic democratic structures. Manifold cases of blatant, destructive racial injustice and inequity and increasing cries for reform and a reckoning and more. Make no mistake, we are in a period of wilderness and while the circumstances are different, I think the primary temptation is the same. To mistrust that God is still present. To no longer believe that God is with us, that God is active, that God is working through us and in the world for a more just world. And when that happens, when we lose confidence in God, that's when we're most likely to take matters into our own hands. And all too often when we lose confidence in God, we also lose the ability to see those who disagree with us as also children of God. The opposite of faith, it turns out, isn't doubt. It's not even disbelief. Rather, it is a sullen despair that makes us blind to seeing the image of God in our neighbor and numb to their need, which is why we come together. It is said that one particular night, Martin Luther invited some friends to share dinner at his home during a particularly challenging time during the Reformation. And during the meal, he began to bemoan the many setbacks they had recently experienced. As the night wore on, Luther's catalog of disappointments grew longer and longer until he suddenly realized that his wife Katie had left the table and come back dressed all in black. <clears throat> when Luther asked her why she had changed her clothes, she responded, Well, to hear you talk, dear Martin, I thought perhaps God had died and I should dress for his funeral. Which caused Luther to first to laugh at his own foolishness and then to remember God's promises to get up from the table and to go back to the ordinary and everyday tasks of preaching and teaching and trust the future of the Reformation and the world to God. Yes, we are in a time of wilderness, make no mistake, but also make no mistake that God is still with us. And of the many gifts God has given us to help us through the wilderness and endure the temptations hurled our way, the chief one is still the blessing and identity given to Jesus at his baptism and to us at ours. So as we draw our time together today for a close, know that as much as I value the preaching of the church, I value its communal life so much more. And so I invite us as we go out in the world today and this week and during this season of challenge to look for opportunities where you get to be Katie Luther to another, reminding each other and those around us that God is still alive and active still making and keeping promises and always regarding you and those around you as God's own beloved child. 
I believe that as we encourage each other to trust God's promises, we will find it easier to hand over our worries and fears, resist the temptation to take matters into our own hands, see those around us also as God's beloved children, and entrust ourselves and our future to God. So as you go forth into the wilderness once more to face the challenges and temptations of the day, hear these words spoken first to Jesus at his baptism and then to us at ours, words of identity and blessing that help us face the future with courage and regard each other, all others, with compassion. You are my child, the beloved, and with you, I am well pleased. Thanks be to God. Amen. tested and wrestle alone, famished for bread when the world offers stone. Nourish us, God, by your word and your way. Food that sustains us by night and by day. When in the desert we cry for relief, pleading for paths marked by certain belief, lift us to love you beyond sign and test, trusting your presence, our only true rest. When we are tempted to barter our souls, trading the truth for the power to control, teach us to worship and praise only you, seeking your will in the work that we Receive this benediction. May God, who keeps all promises and has called you beloved, guide your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, serve the neighbor. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.